Good afternoon, everyone. Before we get too far down the road, just want to make sure that um, you can hear me. I'll take it off of mute. Um, just, just a quick check. Um, audio, video, everything appear to be okay? Yes, Anyone? Good. Okay. Um, feel free to put your, your line on mute if you want. I'm going to mute once we get going and then throughout the presentation I'll unmute uh, at several points in order to um, answer questions. If you have questions as we go, feel free to use the little chat bubble um, second from the left at the top and I'll, I'll answer questions as we go along. <clears throat> also, just a heads up. Um, this is being recorded, so it'll be put on our website. I'll give you instructions on where, where this will be um, after the call is over. And uh, feel free to, to pass it along to others that may be interested or go back and, and look at this in the future if you need to. Okay, I'm going to put you on pause or on, uh, on mute, and uh, away we go. So thanks again for joining the 9000 ISO 9001 2015 update forum number six. So we've uh, we've now gone through six different forums. Uh, the first one was in person in August of 2013. Uh, since then, we've had forums but generally every quarter or so. Um, if you're interested in a previous forum. Uh, we do have the November forum that's recorded um, and also on our website. As I mentioned, this is recorded. Um, we will post that and I'll show you where to get to that. So my name is Jim Thompson. Um, I'm the founder of Concentric Management Systems in downtown Charleston, South Carolina. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't feel like South Carolina right now. It feels like Indiana where I came from, but you know, at least we don't have any snow. This is um, the web address, uh, acommoncenter.com. Here's our street address, 266 Meeting Street, Suite B, and then that's my direct line, 843-469-8279. So what we're gonna do is go through the projected changes as they exist today. Um, every month, we do a little studying here and looking at um, publications, quality progress, articles from um, ISO, articles from TC176, industry magazines, publications, blogs, et cetera, and try to add some new information over the past 30 to 60 days. So if you've joined in the past, there will be a couple things that um, are slides that, that you've seen before. Um, but um, several updates and, and new information have been added to today's presentation. So first off, this illustration here is one addition, just to give you an idea of the timeline. So um, we've been going through this process of reviewing changes to the 9001-2018 standard since June 2012. Um, the projection is that by September of this year, we should have an approved uh, final draft that then goes into uh, the international standard voting um, stage. And if that gets approved, which it's expected to get approved without much trouble, um, the thought is right now, uh, barring any unexpected you know, events or what have you, September, October would be the, the release date. So not long now. A brief history of the 9001 um, standard, the family of documents. So as you know it now, there's eight clauses. There's about 1.2 million registrations worldwide. I've read 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2. But this is companies that are actually registered. 
Um, whether it's 1.1 or 1.4, to me, that number is, is pretty substantial. And what that doesn't account for are the number of organizations that are not registered that choose to use 9001 as the, the framework for how they manage their business. But the, the breadth of the standard uh, as being really the, the largest quality standard adopted globally touches uh, over 140 countries. So right now we're basically on Rev 4. Uh, the first revision was 87, then you had 94, um, 2000. Uh, for those of you that have been around uh, the, the history of 9001 for a while, there was a huge jump between the 94 version and the 2000 version. 2008, there really wasn't much uh, in the way of changes, um, just some, some nomenclature and definition and terms changes for the most part. And so now we're looking at uh, the release in 2015. Just a really quick um, touch on EMS and then also the OHSAS standard uh, because a lot of organizations tend to have those three standards as kind of the baseline of their management system. You'll see more and more um, organizations that have 9001 also um, moving towards environmental and occupational health and safety. Um, but on this slide, 14001, you've got the 17 elements, uh, which is different from the clause structure of the current 9001. Um, over 200,000 registrations globally, and then you you see that uh, 138 countries globally are are, um, are registered. So right now we are in the second revision, or ISO 9000, or sorry, ISO 14001, 2004 for revision two, and then Rev three, uh, 2015, perhaps even early 2016. Uh, OSAS 18001, again, is very, very similar to 14001 in that it, it's made up of 17 elements, uh, 55,000 registrations globally. The, the statistic that was uh, the freshest that we could find was uh, from 2009 survey, um, 116 countries. And um, what you'll see there is uh, a lot of times folks will reference this as ISO 18001. There's actually an ISO 18001 standard, but it has nothing to do with um, health and safety. Um, the, the proper uh, numbering scheme here is OHSAS 18001. It's actually a, a BS OHSAS 18001. It's a British standard at this point, but um, it is projected to be um, an ISO standard in 2015, perhaps early 2016. And that standard number would be called um, ISO 45001. So if you're involved in the occupational health and safety side of things with your organization, uh, this is the new number here, ISO 45001, uh, once it gets approved and released later this year or early next year. So with that said, I am going to stop there and give pause for some, some questions, a few questions, and um, we'll move on from there. Any um, specific questions at this point? Sounds like somebody's going through a car wash. And it sounds like I'm doing a good job so far. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. As I said, I'll unpause or unmute here um, in a few more minutes and give time for some questions. So here's an example of a timeline. So you can kind of see from June 2012 all the way through September 2015, the steps that the standard has to take in order to, to go from an existing standard uh, where, the, where the question 
is, hey, do we revise the existing standard? Do we use it as is, or does the standard um, become obsolete and perhaps replaced with something else? So that process happens about once every five years. Um, so in 2012, there was an initial survey um, that, that went out to the member bodies asking whether or not there should be uh, revisions made to the existing 2018 version. Okay. So this was a, a nice illustration that um, came from Quality Digest. I think it was in November, October, November of, of last year, but a, a very good visual to show how the standards kind of move through the, the update process. Um, I thought this was a really interesting figure as well. So within the ISO organization, there's over 16,500 standards. I mean, that's a lot of standards to manage and uh, to, to keep track of standards all the way from barcoding to, you know, specific tech language, uh, just a, a plethora of standards. Some of those standards uh, an organization can get uh, registered to or certified to, uh, as you might hear uh, frequently referred to. But um, looking at this chart on the right, this is the number of certificates that have been issued, kind of the top 10 globally. And you can see you know, China is by far in the lead with um, you know, 250,000 plus certificates. So there is a technical committee that's driving this change. It's basically a special group of subject matter experts. That group is called TC, which stands for Technical Committee, and they're given the, the number 176. So they're responsible as a group to come up with and oversee revisions, uh, obsolescence changes to the 9,000 family of documents. So back in 2012, there were these surveys that were sent out, uh, 12,000 plus responses, you know, 122 countries represented, saying, "Here's what we believe would be good edits to um, to the 9,000 family of documents." Um, currently, along the chain of of modifications in in drafts. We're past the DIS phase, which is the draft international standard phase. So back in November, early November, um, all of the member bodies uh, from all of the different countries pulled together, basically sat around the table, took a vote on whether to approve the standard as is, and around 90 cents said, yeah, we approved this draft international standard. So the draft international standard became what's called FDIS, which is the Final Draft International Standard. So the next step is approval of FDIS, and I've heard you know, anywhere from uh, around uh, May to, to July timeframe this year, that vote will, will be put up um, for approval and is expected to, to pass without much trouble. Okay, so one of the questions that uh, has come from previous forums and webinars is, well, what happens to special interests or special sectors that use 9001 as, as the baseline? So, you know, ISO TS 16949, AS 9100, um, ISO 13485, so on and so forth. There's quite a few standards that use 9001. Um, as the, the fundamental building blocks, and then within their sector, they just add their sector specifics on top of that. So what is projected to happen there is that the 9001 standard gets approved, it comes out, and then the individual sectors add, uh, you know, on top of, of the new release. And um, there's a projection for, you know, obviously 2016 at some point, but um, I I have not read nor nor have I heard a direct confirmation that um, the automotive sector is is 100% on board with the projected changes. I know there were kind of some headbutting going on um, with uh, TC176 and then the the automotive international automotive task force and and you know major OEMs and their delegates. 
I know aerospace is uh, full speed ahead, but um, I, I've, I've heard, but I haven't seen anything in writing that says uh, the automotive group is is on board and they're going to follow suit with the new layout of of the uh, 9,120-15 provision. So one of the things that we need to look at before jumping into some of the the big picture changes, some of the you know big differences that are going to impact um, organizations as they transition, uh, is this document called Annex LS. So Annex LS is basically uh, the standard for management system standards. So it's a it's really kind of the the common framework. So what Annex LS does and the reason why it's, it is important is that if you're going to be modifying a management system standard like um, ISO 14001, uh, 45001, 27001, you know, a variety of, of management system standards, um, that new standard needs to come out in a format that abides by this content and this layout. So the idea is instead of having an eight clause structure for the quality side and then a 17 element structure for the um, for the uh, uh, environmental side or the health and safety side, the structure and the general layout will be the same for the management system standards across the board, which I think is a really good, um, really good move. It helps companies that have multiple um, certifications that they're seeking or management systems that they're trying to manage. It's it's really going to help them at managing um, their systems. So one of the questions that was just submitted that I don't know the answer to, but I'm happy to to get uh, to do the research to, to give an answer for um, our next webinar is what does SL mean? I don't know what SL means, but I can find out. My guess is something like standard language or it's just uh, the, the next um, lettering scheme uh, that, 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 co that comes along, you know, like 16949, where does that come from? But the real answer is I don't know, but I will find out. Good question. So one of the things before we move on um, that you'll see is these three here, scope, norm of reference, terms and definitions are the same. What's really changing um, dramatically is this right here. So um, right now we have five clauses, clause four through eight. Um, the the new revision, uh, at least as it stands right now in the draft, is uh, you know four through four through ten. So seven distinct clauses or chapters, so to speak, in in the the layout per Annex LS. So the idea here again is that if I'm writing a, a document on document control or um, how I maintain my, my, my records, I can have better alignment due to the standard and the sections of the standard being aligned together. So I know some organizations choose to uh, write a, a, an operating procedure or something like that that might be somewhere along the lines of, um, you know, let's say um, QOP um, 7.1 or something like that. And what, what, the, what they're trying to say is this procedure is connected to some support procedure. Um, I don't know that I would recommend basing your system in a standard layout that flows along with the standard because, you know, look what happened in, in 2000, the, the numbering changed. And here we go again, the numbering and the layout of the standard changes. So, so be very careful 
Um, I, there is no requirement to lay out your documentation or your quality manual or anything like that in this one through 10 structure. So don't let anyone come in and tell you, hey guys, you need to totally rewrite all of your procedures. This one says 4.2, but now it belongs in 7.1 or whatever. You don't have to do that. If you choose to do that, you know, that's up to you, but um, it's not a requirement. I'm going to pause for a second. Any questions before we move to the next slide? Just Jim O'Rourke. Jim O'Rourke. Jim. So it's not required to be, you know, laid out in that format, but it's required to cover all elements, right? That are applicable. That are applicable, yes. So. Very good question. There's a point in here where we talk about um, exclusions versus those items that don't apply. I'll get into a little more detail there, but um, you may just put something together in your system that works for you that says, I'm going to put you on mute. So you may, you might create something that works for you that um, is a cross-reference matrix. You know, here's what the previous version of the standard um, called document control, or here's the number that we use to address uh, the new uh, requirement in the new layout of, of 9001-2015. But um, ideally, and this is something that came about even as far back as 2000, the, the idea is that you define the processes within your organization and you build documentation around those processes, not, you know, fit your organization into the ISO 9001 bucket. You know, it just, it, it never gets adopted um, if, if you're trying to shove your organization into the ISO bucket. It just, it feels foreign and, and a lot of times don't get much management buy-in. Thanks for the, the question, Jim. Um, any other questions? Well, the reason, this is Jim again. The reason why I brought it up is some of our organizations don't have operations, quote unquote, right there, logistics and parts warehouses and so forth, right? Right. So, right. so, so that, would still, fall well, that would still fall under operation. Okay. If the rest of you wouldn't mind um, putting your phone on mute, um, so when I open up for some questions, it's not as robotic, that'd be great. Any other questions? So one question here is, will this be sent to attendees? Um, I'm going to show you where you can get it, and the reason why it's better for me to show you where you can get it is because we add things multiple times a month to this page, um, and, and you can just go there and check it out. Good question, though. Anything else? You're welcome. Okay. So expectations for the for the transition. A couple things that you um, you need to pay attention to. You need to start planning for now. Um, and there there certainly are those things that you don't want to jump con to conclusion with and, and start doing now. But here's some general recommendations from from us to you. So first of all, work directly with your current registrar. Um, there probably should be a bullet point in here, no doubt. I'm actually going to add one. Um, let's see. Definitely recommend that you work directly with your customers as well. So, recommend working with customers on transition. The reason why that's extremely important is because um, for example, when when we were back in QS 9000 days with uh, with the automotive sector, um, TS 16949 was rolled out, and there was a three-year window for transitioning. But those 
those suppliers to um, Daimler Chrysler at the time were given an 18 month window. So, you know, it doesn't really matter what your registrar says. If your customer comes along and says, we're going to trump that by making you accelerate how quickly you move through the transition. Um, there is a three year tra tradition or transition timeline expected. So the, th the thought is a September release in 2015 would mean that you need to be fully transitioned over by 2018. Um, I would strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you start in 2016. Um, you know, some folks are saying, hey, as soon as July hits and um, that final draft international standard comes out, then we know that there's just going to be just a little, a couple little tweaks. And around that time, July through kind of the end of the year is when the registrars themselves and the lead auditors will be going through um, training for themselves. So, um, you know, put a plan into place, start this year, at least in the planning phase. But what you want to do is avoid transition bottom like we saw in, in, in 2003, um, this is going to happen and, you know, we can scream loud and clear and it's still going to happen. Everybody's going to delay, you know, it's just like, you know, December 22nd, the post office is packed full of people sending packages or, you know, the, the last day to file your taxes. There's a bottleneck. There is going to be a shortage. Don't wait until Q3, Q4, 2018 to try to transition because what's going to happen is those companies that do, uh, many of them are going to have a lapse in their certification. And if you don't have um, a waiver from your, your customer, you may not be able to provide products or services to them. So start that dialogue right now. Don't wait until 2018 uh, before you start uh, that transition. Now, one of the other things I've heard um, I, there was a webinar that UL put on and one of their um, managers had stated that um, that the guidelines for transitioning, and I'll, I'll share a link to this um, at the end, um, it's stating that it would be acceptable, at least in its current phase, to transition some part of your system during a surveillance audit and perhaps a, another part of your system during that next surveillance audit, which is, which is kind of strange to me. I, um, you know, it makes sense. Uh, you would just have to document which processes within your management system are under the auspice of the new system and, and you know, which, which are under uh, the, the 2008 version. But anyway, that just some ideas for you. And, um, definitely start right away um, versus waiting until 2018. I'm going to pause there. Um, if you guys could put your phone on mute, if, you're, if it's not already on mute, I'm going to unmute the call. And then if you have any other questions, give a, a 30 seconds or so for that. Questions? Okay, so I'm going to jump into, actually, as long as it stays kind of quiet, I think there's a one person maybe on that's not on mute. Um, if it starts getting noisy, I'll mute everyone again. But the meat here, highlights of the current draft. So as we talked about, the structure is completely um, changing with the exception of one, two, and three, but four through 10 clauses are, are much different than they are now. The other thing that you'll see, um, similar to what you see with um, TS-16949, is there's an annex at the back. So annex A, B, and C are a part of the standard. Um, annex A is just clarification on some of the requirements with, within the standard. Um, Annex B is the QMS principles that you currently see in the front of the standard, the, the eight management principles. And then Annex C is, is a, a page or two about 
the QMS family of standards. So there's a there's a couple of new complementary documents in the 9001 or, or in the QMS bundle, so to speak, and that's what um, Annex C speaks to. So context of the organization. This is something that we haven't seen before and is in the draft. And the, the idea here is that um, similar to 4.1 in the current standard, this standard wants you to, to address in a much more thorough way is who are you? You know, when you say our organization is certified or our organization is registered to, to 9001, what does that mean? You know, what are all the pieces or the parts that are under that uh, fence line or umbrella? Um, which processes within your operations are managed internally uh, versus outsourced maybe to, um, you know, a third party logistics company or a supplier to uh, to do case hardening or or you know something of that nature. Uh, just because a process is outsourced um, does not mean that you're you're not responsible for it. But the idea here in in this first section context of organization is that you define who you are and what all your pieces are. The other piece that's um, expanded quite a bit is what are the needs and expectations of interested parties? So, um, you know, who is an interested party? Is it uh, the end user? I would say yes. Is it uh, the customer that you're delivering the part to? Is it um, your employees, uh, recruiters that are perhaps uh, an outsource to uh, your HR department? So, this section requires you to more clearly define who you are as an organization and what all your, your parts are. Uh, the next section scope uh, it, and really is define the applicability of, of your system. There, um, Jim, you had asked a question earlier about um, exclusions perhaps in, a, in an industry that's more logistics rather than um, production. Um, you will find that the updates to the standard are much, much more um, service friendly. That's something that has been a big push. Um, some folks don't like the fact that they feel like uh, because they're in production or in a, in a production environment that the standard's gotten a little bit too loose with the language. Um, but, you know, I guess that depends on, on your perspective. Um, there is no reference to exclusions here uh, that we currently see in Clause 7, okay? Clause 7 today says if you have an exclusion, then you make that exclusion and that becomes a part of your quality manual. Um, if there's a requirement that can't be applied, then you just have to document that and, and um, ensure that you're still able to provide conformity in in your products and processes. So basically whatever it takes to meet the customer expectation. But that again is something that um, kind of goes hand in hand with 4.1. Define who you are and, and this is something that the um, health and safety and the environmental piece or environmental side has, has done well with in the past. You know, define your fence line. What's your property line? Where, where do you stop and your supplier start or an outsource process starts, um, you know, just graphically and in, 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 a, in a documented way, define who you are, what all your moving parts are, and what the scope of your management system is. So another change is this phrase top management, that's um, gone and replaced with leadership. Um, there is a requirement that's very similar to what we have now, which is the leadership's responsible for your um, QMS policy and making sure that your objectives align with the policy. Uh, your policy shouldn't say, you know, quality is job one and one of your objectives is who cares about quality, let's buy cheaper components. You know, those, those things aren't, aren't in alignment. Um, another thing that you'll see uh, a bit more bulked up, which I think is great, is the commitment of leadership. Um, and 
in 2000, there was an entire uh, subclause dedicated to um, management commitment, and there, there's there's quite a bit more language now in the 2015 draft for uh, that commitment and what auditors are expecting to see. Um, again, we want the QMS and the BMS or the quality and the business operations, day-to-day -day business management system uh, direction to be the same. And this is something, the last bullet point that I think is, is rather interesting, um, specifically on kind of if you compare this to um, TS-16949 or, or aerospace, um, you know, there was a, an additional role that was thrown in in automotive and aero called customer representative, and that could be multiple people, uh, but management representative was still, um, you know, one person that was identified within the organization that was a member of the management of that company's uh, organization. Uh, the draft, as it sits now, is showing that a management representative could be more than one person. So perhaps some of you that are um, you know, carrying the load uh, yourselves as, as management system coordinators or management representatives, that may come as a bit of, of a relief to you. QMS planning 6.1. So this is a huge change right here. Well, one of the biggest is really looking forward and asking the question, what are our opportunities and what are our risks? So I put uh, this illustration of a SWOT analysis here because that is often used in industry uh, to, to define what are your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, but there's this key phrase called risk-based thinking that we haven't seen before. Um, and the idea is, you know, we need to put risk-based targets, goals, and objectives together. We need to think about uh, what is the effect of a failure, what's the effect of something happening that, that we may not expect to happen, what could the impact be, what could, what could let's say, um, changing from uh, one shift to two shifts or from supplier A to supplier B, you know, what are all the things that could possibly happen and do your best to think about um, either risk management or risk mitigation or acceptance of the risk um, in your QMS planning. So <clears throat> preventive action actually is not in the standard. So you will have a correction and you will have risk-based thinking, but you won't have preventive action. And, and let's face it, I mean, preventive action is typically, hey guys, let's hurry up and create a PAR because the audit's tomorrow, you know, which means that the company doesn't quite understand and the standard hasn't been very clear on what do you mean by preventive action. So risk and risk-based thinking um, hopefully will, will get organizations to be more proactive and some, some sectors like automotive and aerospace um, have already been forced to think in this way through the use of um, failure modes and effects analysis or, or other risk-based tools. Change management, 6.3. So little Dilbert um, cartoon here, it says, I'll need a project plan to justify the resources we need to change our software. And Dilbert says, I can make those software changes in 10 seconds. Done. And then his boss says, good work. Now all we need is that plan. So, uh, you know, a bit of a, a joke here, but the thought is you need to sit down uh, with a cross-functional team and evaluate what, what could possibly go wrong and what are potential opportunities for for changes, changes to products, changes to processes, changes in personnel. Um, so planning changes, controlling changes, and then once again, a risk-based approach, risk-based thinking approach to change management. Um, there's a note here that says um, review ISO 31000. Um, 31000 is, is the risk management um, ISO standard. So. If you're interested in learning a bit more about that um, and kind of getting ahead of the curve here, um, I would recommend that you buy 
uh, or check out or, or seek some training or what have you on, on ISO 31000. Um, the, the extent that you control a change should be the extent in, in which that change is going to affect your products, your processes, uh, other interested parties. Um, so just keep that in mind. I mean, they're, they're small, small risks and small changes versus big risks and big changes. You know, come up with a structured tool or process uh, for change management uh, and make sure that you're, you're planning for those changes in an effective way. Um, I'm really excited about never using the word competency again. Um, I hate the word competency because if you ask as an auditor, are your employees competent? It, it, it tends to have a negative connotation in this country. So um, knowledge is one of the terms that is generalized and is being used as opposed to uh, the competency piece. So um, necessary knowledge, that, that's for you to define. What's the knowledge needed to achieve conformity of the product, of the processes, expectations from your customer? Um, you know, what's the knowledge needed to effectively operate your defined processes? And employees need to have access to, to that knowledge. You know, saying, well, I've got something on the shared drive doesn't equal knowledge. Or I sent you an email on our policies and procedures. That does not equal knowledge. So, so make sure that um, you know those folks that need a, a certain level of knowledge in particular areas have access to that. I think that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, sufficient knowledge versus the needs for for work instruction. So, um, some disciplines you just hire in a qualified um, team member, where other disciplines perhaps is more uh, knowledge that's supplemented by visual work instruction, standard work, um, other key documentation or, or flow diagrams and what have you. Um, this is a tip for me. This does not come from um, 9001, but the rule of thumb that I've, um, I guess, that served me well and I've used in the past is where the absence of a document can create a non-conformity, then you should strongly consider having that document there, you know, as a supplement to the knowledge that that, that user um, brings to that process, okay? So before we go on to the, uh, the Annex uh, A, B, and C in further detail, I'm going to take it off of mute again and um, see if there are any questions at this point. Go ahead. So this is Jim again. So I talk talking a lot, but um, so <laughs> to, to to assess That's risk, right. I mean, don't don't you have to look at your process, how it's currently operating? So you kind of, when you go back to the car parts idea, I mean, um, you know, you may be at a certain risk with a given process, but in order, to, you need kind of need to know where you're at before you can maybe plan your risk assessment, if you will. Or right. Does, or, or does the other one talk about? Just thinking about it in terms of an FMEA, which is, so, you know, supposing risk. So there's there's risk planning for those things that don't exist. You know, looking ahead for um, risk associated with new processes, and then there's risk capturing the current risk as they exist right now. So that's where, for example, um, you can you can easily rank the severity. You can easily rank the occurrence and the detection because you, you're you dealing with that risk or that nonconformity on a day-to-day -day basis. But there may be risk, let's say, um, in uh, you know, bring, uh, it's, I think somebody said rework in the back. Hey, feet, hey, throw me curve, or throw me uh, underhanded uh, softballs all day, please. Uh, yeah, rework, if you've never done rework before um, to, Perhaps you, instead of scrapping a, an entire unit, you want to salvage, um, you know, the, the 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 bigger unit and just replace a component. If that's never been done before, you might want to look at um, what are what are the the potential risks there, not only for um, a non-standard process, 
but you may have uh, safety risk or environmental risk. Um, so Training. the idea there is bring in a cross-functional team, um, sit down, look at the changes, look at the risk, and, and, and calibrate those weights that you come up with with actual data, you know, actual PPM or fallout data um, to make sure that you're, you're being honest and accurate with, with your grading of risk. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to put you on mute again and um, head into the And a lot of times it's because the mindset is not risk-based. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's not risk-based. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if I tell you, take it from the custom side, we've got to have A, B, or C. You're just thinking about E done. I don't have time to go. You know what I'm saying? We don't have enough staff in place, but you have to look at the risk. So what kind of fines, what kind of penalties, mm -hmm. what other exposures are out there. Because sometimes you know, yeah. people, like employees, will we need more people to help with this because stuff falls through the cracks. They're like, oh, no, blah, blah, blah. They're not. But right, but here the actual risk. So it's really going to become about. Yeah. And like I said, even with the change of work, it's really transitioning to a change of mindset. Yeah. For you to clearly understand, hey, hey, let's remove this vagueness where you figure, oh yeah, people, you sure your people are confident? Well, no, because with the <coughs> I can take anybody at any knowledge level and say, follow the picture, do yeah, one, two, three. Yeah, we don't need answer you, man. Versus you yeah. having to know specific. Yeah. You know, different things. I'm yeah, excited I agree. about it. We yeah. do a lot. You know, all of our stuff is, has to be based on risk assessment. That's from a custom standpoint. As I say, most of it. Now, some management, like management checklists, it's like, they only come down to, like, I, I used to work at the R&P plant for 16 years. So, oh, okay. Um, most of the so, time, it'll come awesome. down and, because of the yeah, hot issue. But we've been telling, I, I say the same thing, day okay. one, day two, day Probably three, day four, day five, mm -hmm. something with the lines. Yeah. Escalated beyond. Then they want to come down to the floor and then, oh, we're going to do this and do this. And say, hold up. Then I have to go down there and say, then they will call me down. All this stuff, they didn't work. I'm like, okay, let's look at it. Okay, we told y'all this from day one, that this wasn't working. But no, everybody want to put it off until. Yeah, so. Hello, hello, hello. Are we back? Yes, I can hear you now. All right. I don't know what happened, but I got kicked off for a second. I could see that people were um, were saying that they couldn't hear anything but music or chatter, but we're back. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the heads up. I wish I could give a prize to a viewer 14. You're the big winner. Thanks for giving me the heads up. So I want to move on to um, Annex B. So Annex B is very similar to what's in the beginning of the standard now, um, which is the seven management principles versus the eight. It's, it's a, a little bit different. You'll see um, you know, engagement of people. You'll see improvement versus continual improvement or continuous um, evidence-based decision-making. Uh, relationship management, not just supplier management, but relationship management. So that's um, what Annex B is all about. And C just gives you um, a little bit more detail in what's now going to be the, the ISO 10001 portfolio rather than what we currently call the ISO 9000 family of documents. So that, that 10001 gives further guidance on QMS implementation and then using your, your QMS to drive organizational improvement. Uh, there's also three different SC1, 2, and 3. That's subcommittees to TC176 that have responsibility for um, managing the updates to 
of these bundle of documents. So what are the next steps? So we have the review of and comments given for the, um, the draft inter, or the final draft international standard. Um, and that, that final draft international standard that's out now is, is slated to be um, voted on. And uh, that's, that votes somewhere around the July, June, July timeframe. Um, and then after that, it would be on to uh, the final vote for uh, the international standard piece. So here is just kind of going back to, to that first slide, an illustration that shows really kind of a three year um, transition of, of developing the document uh, to a point where it could be approved and released in September 2015. And then we have about that same amount of time, uh, September 2015 through September uh, 2018 to uh, transition over to the new standard. So a couple things real quick, there were some questions about um, where will this be or can you get a copy or what have you. And that will be, if you go to um, our website, which is a commoncenter.com, you can just type in um, ISO 9001-2015 or you can go under, um, let's see right here, annotate this. If you go under this products, there's a drop down box. Uh, I think it's the third on the pick list that says um, 9001 2015 uh, reference center or something like that. Uh, there's a ton of great stuff on here. Um, the other thing that you could do if you want, and you know, my marketing gal Ronnie will smack me for saying this, but um, this right here, you can subscribe to when uh, we do have updates. I hate email. I get a bazillion emails a day, so I wouldn't do this. Um, but you know, feel free to feel free to do it. Megan's looking at me like she's going to slap me uh, on behalf of Ronnie. <laughs> but you just put your email address, first and last name, subscribe, and then when these things um, get released as blogs, uh, they hit your inbox. Do it or don't do it. Um, like I said, I wouldn't do it. My preference is just to to bookmark a link and go back to uh, checking it on a regular basis, but that's because I get way too much email. Um, this is how you get a hold of us. So um, I'm Jim Thompson again. Uh, Meg Brandel's here in the office. Ronnie is uh, here in the office and virtual kind of goes back and forth. Um, but there's the phone number. And then if you want to e-stalk us in any way, those are all the ways that, um, that you can connect with us. Um, surprisingly, Facebook, Instant Messenger, and Facebook, our Facebook page on, um, as a Facebook group is very popular. I wouldn't have expected that. I would have thought more traffic on LinkedIn, but you know, whatever way you want to uh, engage with us, we're here to help. Um, with that said, I'm gonna ask uh, that uh, you, Fill the rest of the time by asking any questions that you might have or recommendations for um, a webinar in uh, the next month or two. Are there some things that are uh, that were not in here that you'd like to see the next round? Um, we got about eight minutes for you to, um, to open the floor and ask any questions. But while you're thinking of questions, um, I just wanted to look to see what the exact URL is. So it's just ISO 9001-2015 um, after our website. But here's an example of the video from November. And then later this week, we'll have uh, today's video published and, and put right here. So just click on it and you'll be able to, to watch it. Uh, you can also forward it along. But here's a ton of different key links. Um, this is something that was updated this uh, this month, uh, transition planning guidance for 9001. So there's, there's a lot more resources now that are free and available and online and downloads and you don't have to pay for. So 
we try to, uh, anytime our essays are out and, and see an article or a video or YouTube or whatever, uh, we try to capture that and at least list it here. Um, and then, Hello, uh, my, name, my name is Ron. No, go ahead. My name is Ron. Uh, I had to step away for a little while, but you was making reference to ISO 31000. What, what was that pertaining to? That is the um, risk management standard. Okay. So the, the the recommendation that I had was, you know, if you if you want to really kind of get on top of this thing early, um, seeing that risk-based thinking is the biggest, uh, you know, kind of the, the biggest change coming with the new standard, um, go go get that document. There's also a blog that uh, one of our guys, Glenn G, who's um, an aerospace expert. Um, published back in in December, and it gives you all these risk based documents that you may want to look at in trying to study uh, how to best tackle the risk based thinking. So the, the one that I re uh, referred to specifically was this one right here: um, risk management, uh, 2009 version. So. Good question. Okay. Uh, also, along those same lines, uh, are, are you thinking risk management as a procedure or work instruction overall, or as it pertains to each of your each of our own documents that we have in our QMS? So the the direction right now is for you to define what your risks are. Um, my recommendation, again, based on my experience, um, I, I would document that. And I, I'm more of a, I don't like 20 page operating procedures. I don't like, I don't like things people aren't going to read. So right. I really like FMEAs. I really like, if they're used right, I like um, risk, a uh, risk matrix. And I mean, you could go into Google and just type in, you know, uh, opportunity space risk matrix and you'll get you know nine boxes and 12 boxes and so the thought is um you know if your process owners let's say you have 10 process owners for the 10 processes within your organization you want them to think about what are the potential risks for the uh, processes that you manage and that might be it it might be um you know, uh, HR or personnel management. Um, one example where I've seen this used that was proactive and, and a great, a really great use of the risk-based thinking is there was a matrix put together to show and consider which um, job titles or which functions within our organization uh, are we really susceptible for a major hit if somebody were to uh, win the lottery tomorrow and, and you know, and roll out and, and, and move out of that position? So this thought process can be applied not just to production, but uh, those support and management processes as well. Great okay. question. Very good okay, question. Okay, great. Great. If you... Um, if you have no clue about FMEAs, um, I think if I just put FMEA in here to search the site, there's a, a, a blog or two, yeah, the use and misuse of an FMEA, what the heck is an FMEA. So there's a lot of stuff on here that's free um, that, you know, you can use. If you have any questions, you, know, you can always call one of us. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? If you do have questions down the road, um, my my email address is jim.thompson at cmsicharleston.com. So just put, put my name in here, jim.thompson at cmsicharleston.com, and you can get to me that way. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and stay tuned. We'll probably do... Um,
another webinar March April time frame and certainly as the uh, the final draft gets approved and the standard uh, gets released uh, we'll be having more frequent um, webinars so thanks and have a great rest of your week bye bye